Financial planning and security can sometimes be seen as a moving target. The rules change constantly, and you need guidance to stay ahead of the market moves. This is the Labenthal Report with Michael Hartzman and Dominic Tavella, with additional insight from industry veteran Jordan Kimmel. We'll break down the news, trends, and overall direction of the markets, telling you what may be coming next, investment opportunities, and what to avoid. Now, here are your hosts, Dominic Tavella and Michael Hartzman. And good evening, everyone. I am Michael Hartzman. Today is Tuesday, June 1st, 2021. And I'm on, as always, with my partner, Dominic Tavella. How are you, Dom? Good evening, Mike. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. So I can't keep quoting Yogi Berra every week and say it's deja vu all over again. Um, because it's just been another week where the markets basically moved up or down a point. This week it was up 1%. I'll take it. But um, the markets remain um, range bound for, I think you just said, six weeks now. So a um, little bit more of the same. Yeah, we, we went through a little volatility last month. And, um, you know, if you actually paid attention to it like we do every day, they were, they were days and moments. But if you kind of closed your eyes on the first of last month and opened them the first of this month, the, the S&P was virtually unchanged, just slightly higher, right? And uh, uh, after two weeks in a row of a downward trend in the S&P, it uh, reversed and went up last week. But in the big scheme of things, it's been a big yawn session for the markets. And that's healthy. I think, I think when the markets take uh, these periods of time, uh, in this case, about six weeks to consolidate and kind of get their footing, I, I think that's a healthy part to, to the market and something that we're, we're grateful to have, this pause. Yeah, six weeks ago, people worried about inflation. And that was the big trade. And that's why the market sold off a little bit. And I think now the inflation trade is kind of getting built into this range bound market that we have now. And, and the inflation story is seems to be getting under control from the point of view, it's not out of control. The 10 year right now is 1.6. Six weeks ago is 1.75. So the inflation story hasn't changed, but it appears that the, the, the bond market has accepted its fate, for lack of a better word. So, you know, uh, uh, Mike, we were all looking at this picture six and eight weeks ago, and we were expecting bad news on the inflation front. And frankly, we got it, right? The numbers that we got have not been pretty. It shows that we have quite a bit of inflation in the economy. But I think what the market has accepted, to your point, is that these numbers maybe will not stay this high for, for the foreseeable future, that it, it is what the Fed is saying is transitory, that they will see it roll off later on this year uh, and come back to a more normal number. Uh, and the 10 year, you've, you alluded to it, Mike, is, is uh, kind of accepting that maybe inflation will not be as horrific later on. But I do think that is the million dollar question. Will it continue to go up or will it finally roll over and come down and get to more acceptable levels? And I think that will drive the market through for the rest of the year. It could. And especially now that we're heading into the summer, the dog days, where markets could get lazy and sloppy. And the worry with the summer trading always is volume seems to decrease in the summertime. So if there's a day where the market gets spooked of something and there isn't anyone to step in to support it, that's when you could have some ugly days in the summer. But that's not anything new either. That's a phenomenon that's been going on for decades, basically. Uh, for decades, Mike. Again, you're spot on on that point. Um, look, we're, we're coming through the end of earnings season. So company noise, top line, bottom line growth for expected profits, guidance for the rest of the year, all that stuff quiets down now. People do take some vacation time, step away from the desk. Um, and, and so little things can have pretty dramatic uh, effects on the market itself. But a little bit of a pause here, a little bit of a pullback in the markets is actually quite normal. And again, I, I don't think unhealthy. I think uh, uh, investors, us allocators would actually use those as opportunities to continue to to put money to work in in, in very strategic areas, um, and and we have right. We've talked about it in past shows. So yeah, I think I expect a little bit of volatility, but I don't think anything terribly dramatic. Hopefully, I agree. So just to switch gears, tonight's guest 
is a portfolio manager from the Lasante Small Cap Growth Fund, the founder, actually, Mary Lasante. And in preparing for the show, I was looking at the small cap performance in general. And, and what was really interesting is, you know, we use a lot of verbiage around here, but large cap, mid cap, and small cap are kind of phrases we use virtually every week. And when people think of a small cap investment, it's typically a lesser known company. It's typically a smaller company that's on a growth trajectory. And you really never look at them as value companies because typically a small cap company by its very nature is in its growth stage. But what was really interesting is year to date, the small cap value sector is up 27% year to date, which is by far the best sector in all the categories. And the small cap growth is only up 4.1. So I'm really anxious to get Mary's input on that, how, why that seems so counterintuitive longer term. So we know the small cap value sector has been a sector that's really underperformed, really got wrecked last year and prior years had not done all that well. And now it's finally started to recover. I think that's part of the, the reason why it's overperforming. But let's not forget to mention the, the point that you need to rebalance and rotate your portfolio. What worked last year is not necessarily what's going to work this year. And if you're not paying attention, you miss these opportunities completely. Oh, yeah, we talk about that every week, right? Our two favorite examples are energy and real estate, which were terrible last year and industry leaders, category this leaders this year. Exactly right, Mike. So on that note, we will be right back with Mary Lasante from the Lasante Small Cap Growth Fund. Financial planning and security can sometimes be seen as a moving target. The rules change constantly, and you need guidance to stay ahead of the market moves. This is the Labenthal Report. All right, I'm Michael Hartzman, back with Dominic Tavella. And our guest this evening is Mary Lasante from the Lasante Small Cap Growth Fund. Welcome, Mary. Thank you for having me. Good evening, Mary. How are you? Good. How are you? So, Mary, in 2019, your fund was up 25%. And in 2020, it was up an astonishing 52.85%. So is it safe to say we're shooting for 75% this year? Just keep... <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> No, I think that, um, you know, as you said, Michael, towards the end, the world is changing. And so if, if you look at what's gone on, we really had a recession recovery um, on steroids, you know, when you think about 2020. And so basically many things got mispriced because we thought the pandemic would be worse than it was for the public companies. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so you know, they started to recover. And then as they started to recover, because of all the government help that people got and that companies got, um, GDP is much stronger than people expected. So the market is broadening out and that's a very good thing. Um, and that's much more normal, honestly, than what you've seen the past few years where, you know, were a couple of sectors and a certain type of growth that was topical. Mm -hmm. um, and when the market narrows like that, it's, it's never a good sign. So this is sort of more normal. And I think, you know, as far as value versus growth, value is playing catch up um, a little bit. The banks are doing better because rates went up a bit. Uh, industrials are doing better because we're coming out of our second recession in 24 months for the industrial companies. I think going forward, it's really going to be about the rate of earnings growth that companies have. And that should be a very good environment for stock pickers, whether they're growth or value. So Mary, you, you hinted at it already. I had brought it up earlier. You know, the value sector and just in general, not just small caps, just so underperformed for so long, so yeah. unloved, right? Yeah. And, and when we see new clients come on board, they have, have virtually no exposure to the value side of, of, of equities at all. What, do you, what are you looking at going forward and for how long? So I, the way that I, I see it is that we had a nice rebound in value. And I think going forward, you're gonna get a much more even market. So, you know, it depends on really, I guess, you know, um, 
It depends on how you define value. So certain sectors have fallen into the value camp strongly, uh, financials, certain uh, real estate investment trusts. I mean, when you look at the indices, the value indices are very tilted towards financials. But when we look at it, we're looking at rates of earnings growth. So one of the areas that's been very unloved has been consumer cyclical. We happen to be overweight consumer cyclical. We're overweighted because the companies, particularly through the pandemic, had to get lean and mean. They had to move digitally. And you know the consumer savings rate is 26%. Last time it was that high was World War II, and it took us four years to work it down. So the consumers are going to spend some money. It's going to drive you know, a lot of the consumer stocks, but the only reason they've been value stocks is that because they have a low PE relative to their growth rates. So to us, that's just mispriced growth. So again, it really depends, I think, on the rate at which you can sustain uh, earnings growth. But I think one of the keys will be you're gonna have to have earnings growth. It's gonna be harder for companies that don't have earnings growth to do better because they almost act like zero coupon bonds. So if rates continue to go up slowly, um, you know they might be under some pressure. But I think we've made probably 80 or 90% of the adjustment at this point. And the thing to remember is in November of last year, growth took a huge jump up. I mean, multiples really expanded dramatically and that's not normal. And so it really was, everybody wanted to own companies that were doing well through the pandemic. Now, as we're coming out of the pandemic, the economy is reopening, it's much more evenly dispersed. So, you know, that's how we look at it. I, historically in small cap, you've never made money, whether you're value or growth, by buying stocks that are just cheap. They have to have earnings growth. So they have to be starting to grow. I think that's still going to be true you know, again, whether it's growth or it's value. And one of the things that we do is, you know, is we define growth really broadly. We don't just look at secular growth. We have a whole way that we look at the world. We have three different buckets, secular, structural, transformational, and we invest in every sector. And the reason we do is because what we're seeing now is a little bit more normal, a broad market, that really is ripe for stock selection, as opposed to a market focused on one particular kind of company and one or two, you know, industries or sectors. So Mary, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive because a small cap growth company by its very nature might not have any earnings, right? They're a, they're a go-go company. They're a company you've never heard of. And then, a small cap value company with a low PE is technically good. You want to invest in a company with a, with, with a low price to earnings ratio. So mm -hmm. to Dominic's point, why was the small cap value so sector so unloved where even in the small cap category, that is still the safer bucket to be in? Well, small cap value was unloved for a couple of reasons. The first is is you have to remember, I think almost 30% of the index is financial stocks. Mm -hmm. So as interest rates came down, that put pressure on them. And then the second thing that happened was that people, um, investors came to the view that in small cap value were what we would call zombie companies. These were companies that people thought would never adapt to the new world. So for instance, a specialty retailer, Okay, and they would say, well, they could never survive because they've got bricks and mortar, they've got stores, they're never going to make it in the digital age. And, and the truth is very different. Many of those companies have spent the past four or five years transforming their businesses so they're omni-channel. And this is the thing about small companies that to me is always so interesting. They're very dynamic. They have to be because they don't have a brand name. All right, so they're not IBM. They're not JP Morgan, all right? They're not gonna be able to survive just on their brand equity. They have to be able to adapt to the times and to change. And they have been changing. And we started to see it in the pandemic. So that's part of what happened is that people's perceptions 
were a little bit out of whack with reality. That was true in some of the industrial areas as well. And so, but I do think it, it is the main driver has been the financial stocks, which as interest rates have started to go up and inflation has started to come back. And remember the Fed says they want to reflate. They usually get what they want. Now, two to 3% inflation in our minds is sort of normal. Deflationary periods are not normal and high inflationary periods are not normal. Uh, if you go back to the 1700s, for most of the time, the United States was in existence. Inflation's been two to 3%. And so this is just, we're going back to normal. I don't believe we're gonna have runaway inflation. It takes, as you know, I was in the markets the last time we had it, um, when, it when inflation went to 21%, interest rates went to 21%. And we had to do, we had to do an awful lot of work to get to that point. We had to make a lot of mistakes. And so at this point, I think we're probably gonna have what, what I would call a more normal investing environment. That means that there'll be more balance between value and growth and more disparity between individual managers. Mm -hmm. Mary, we, we've been an investor in your fund for a very long time and, and we're grateful. Thank you for, for the amazing job you've done for us. But one of my favorite reasons why we love this sector uh, small or mid caps is that large companies come along and swallow up the little companies, right? How do you innovate? You go and buy your competitors, some little company right. that's that's the little speedboat. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on in your portfolio, and then just in general, what's going on in in the small mid cap sector? Sure. So we've had that uh, phenomenon occur, and actually, where we've seen a huge amount of it over the past couple of years, Dom, has been in biotech where we find these wonderful little companies and the big guys come along and scoop them up. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a I guess it's a high class problem. You know, we, we end up doing very well, but then we have to replace it with another stock because it's, it's you know, it's been bought by Merck or Pfizer or someone like that. Um, we've had a little bit of a, a hiatus in um, mergers and acquisitions in the smaller companies year to date. And I think that's because the landscape in Washington is changing the tax landscape is changing. Historically, when that happens, bigger companies pause until they're clear on what's going on. And then they can basically do their numbers. But there's no question, the majority of the innovation in our economy resides in the smaller companies. So I think you're gonna to continue to see that. In fact, if indeed the economy continues to grow nicely, which it appears it, it should for the next couple of years, we think that's going to accelerate. Uh, fairly dramatically as we go forward. Mary, for the benefit of our listeners, not to put you on the spot, and it doesn't have to be companies that you own, could you give us some examples of small cap companies that you think our listeners would have heard of or maybe even own or use their products? Sure. Well, um, I would say a perfect example would be um, and, and it's unusual for this time. So small cap companies, as you said, usually, Michael, grow, and then they continue to grow, and they grow out of small cap. But sometimes what happens to small companies, um, companies end up in small cap land because of something that happened to them. So a perfect example are some of the airlines. Mm -hmm. So believe it or not, JetBlue and Allegiant Airlines are small cap companies. Now, wow. they won't stay there, okay? Mm -hmm. But because of the pandemic, they ended up in our market cap range. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we bought some of the airlines, last time we bought them was 0809. And they turned out to be wonderful investments over a five year time horizon. We think the same thing is going to happen again because they're gonna get lean and mean. Other companies would be that they might've heard of would be companies like American Eagle, mm -hmm. which believe it or not, they're the, you know, the queens and kings of uh, denim. Mm -hmm. And basically, um, they have totally transformed their business. They're probably 40% uh, digital at this point. And we're starting a new fashion cycle in denim, which will be very powerful for them. Now, they basically are, they work from teens to probably people in the 20s. I'd say, you know, probably um, 15 to 25 year olds is their sweet spot of the market. But... Um, they've done a really good job transforming their business. 
and improving their profitability. Texas Roadhouse is another one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and there, the restaurants are really interesting because we've taken 100,000 restaurants out of the picture. Now, depending upon how you count it, we either had 660 or 900,000 restaurants. We had 660,000 full service restaurants in the country. So we've taken 16% of that um, capacity out of the um, industry for the first time since I can remember, and I've gone back more than 20 years, we're not overstored in the restaurant industry. And that's incredibly important because what it means is, is that the companies have pricing power and they're going to, dis the public companies will disproportionately benefit from the, um, from this market share. And so we see already these companies are ahead of 2019 sales, not 20 sales, but 2019 sales, and they're more profitable. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the things that is changing that's really important is when you start to see inflation come back a little bit, even if it's low inflation, the ability to raise prices is really important. And we're seeing companies are tight on supplies. They're not discounting. Again, we took a lot of companies out of the retailing industry. So you're not seeing the discounts. You're seeing companies able to take price. And we think that that's really important. We think it's going to be truer, more so in the smaller companies than it will be in the big companies because they don't have as much uh, competition, obviously, since they're domestic as opposed to the global companies. So, Mary, I hate to put you in the spot because it's a little bit out of out of what we're talking about. But, you know, we're seeing higher price every time I sit down and go out to a restaurant. Right. Or, or yeah. God forbid, go to a Home Depot or or a lumber yard. You're seeing much higher prices. And the Fed keeps telling us that, well, that's going to transition and eventually it'll come back down. But it's hard for me to believe that if I went to a restaurant, and they charged me twenty dollars for a hamburger, that it's going to be back to twelve dollars even three months from now. Right. Uh, right. That we become more accepting of these higher prices. And even if they go down a little bit, they're not going to go back to where they were. So how much of this inflation just becomes systematic? It's just embedded inside what we cost a living and what we are, right. how we function every day. And how much of it really will go away as the pipeline opens up? So the economists that I talked to um, have said that the 4.6% that we saw is too high, partly because we're comparing it to a year ago, it was a negative number. And the way that they do it basically inflates it. But is there is there already probably two to 3% inflation embedded in the economy? I think so. And I think that's gonna be with us for a while. So I do think the Fed has succeeded in what it wants. It just wants to make sure it stays there. And so uh, my guess is we're gonna be, as I said earlier, back to normal, which is two to 3% inflation, that does imply that ultimately we peak out at about 3% interest rates eventually. And my guess is the Fed will be very careful in how they get us there um, because of the debt load that we have in the country. I think profit growth will be stronger than people expect because this um, mild inflation is going to lead to price increases of 2 to 3%, which will last for the next several years. And I think that that's a big change. And what it means is profit growth in small caps will be much better than people are expecting. And that should power the, that should power the asset class. So one last question about that, because we are running out of time. Are you worried in the small cap space that the cost of borrowing will go up for them when the feds raise interest rates? So this is the thing that's very interesting. Most of the companies um, have really good balance sheets, the public companies. We don't see a lot of companies that have um, an enormous amount of debt. And those that do have spent the past six months restructuring it. So a lot of them refinance their debt. Um, they went out and they did converts. Um, they did uh, bond offerings to get 1% you know, money. So I think that at least the smaller companies probably don't have that now. Can't answer for the private guys, but the public guys, look like they're in very good shape. And they're focused on being cash flow positive because they do want to continue to grow. 
And Mary, okay. to well, a I don't point see that as an earlier, issue. They, they've gotten lean and mean, right? These companies, yes. in order to have gotten through what we've been through in the last 12 months, they, they've they really, they've cut back on, whether it's it's on uh, employees, where they've come back on facilities, they, they've they really gotten lean. Yeah, and, and we think productivity will improve, will continue to improve, because they're not gonna throw everything back on. All right, and, and I think that that's so important. Well, Mary, on that note, we are literally out of time. I, I, I thank you for, uh, for joining us and hopefully we'll have you back again down the road. Love you, Thanks for having Thanks, me. Mary, and thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mary. We'll be right back. Financial planning and security can sometimes be seen as a moving target. The rules change constantly, and you need guidance to stay ahead of the market moves. This is the Labenthal Report with Michael Hartzman and Dominic Tavella. Now, back to the Labenthal Report. And welcome back to the Labenthal Report. I'm Jordan Kimmel, Chief Market Strategist and Portfolio Manager, and I'm here with my longtime friend and colleague, Ed Matlock. Ed, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Jordan. Thanks for having me. It's fantastic to have you again. I just want to really expand on a discussion earlier. And for reference, everybody, um, Ed and I go back 20 years. He is our at Labenthal, my at our SMAs. Uh, he is helping as our risk manager for our separately managed accounts. And Ed, I have to just, before we even get into the marketing sectors, we go back so far, you know, I, I, I call you my favorite risk manager in the country, one of America's most favorite. Um, we also have had on Aaron Brown. Um, remember we went to visit AQR? Yes, I do. Uh, yeah. Only about 10 or 12 years ago when they only right. had about 150 billion under management. So we, we go back, there's very few people folks that know my strategy as well as Ed. And so, Ed, thank, thanks so much. Listen, I, before I even say one more thing, I have to say that Mary Lasanti in, you know, discussion before, I want to, you know, expand on it. I'm a huge fan of hers. And can people talk about the market, Ed? How's the market doing? Then they say, how's the sector doing? Uh, spend a couple minutes on hedge metrics itself. You know, uh, what you provide to the hedge fund world out there. Uh, and, and how we can get, then get into how I'm benefiting from all your research. Well, what Hedge Metrics does really is we look at uh, uh, a client's total portfolio and try to make sure that, or, or point out how they're positioned vis-a-vis -vis sector weightings and factor weightings. And factor weightings are sort of like sectors, but they don't have that name, like, uh, you know, uh, large cap, small cap, uh, high quality, low quality, high yield, low yield, things like that. And often uh, factors or stocks in those groups tend to move together. And it doesn't seem to matter whether their earnings are good or bad or whatever, if that sector is moving, most of the stocks in those sectors move. So you really have to look at a portfolio both ways to see what's going on. Of course, the right. other parts of risk are you know, not overpaying and trying to keep uh, valuation in reasonable limits and things like that. And, and I, just, I just wanna say one other thing. Yeah. Uh, we opened uh, uh, before talking about that the market's in the same place today as it was 30 days ago, which is true, but underneath it is not true. There's been a big rotation from one set from different sectors. Uh, energy is, has started to go up um, materials and inflation sensitive stocks have been doing very well. Um, and that's one of the one of the reasons why you're seeing the smaller cap stocks outperforming because all these stocks didn't go up for 20 years. And so they became value by definition. But um, as inflation continues, assuming that it does to some extent, they're going to continue to do well. And right. Well, well the, well, the neat part of it, I know, is that your degrees in economics, and then you bring all the uh, the actual stochastics and quantitative piece into that. But but on that point, Ed, you know, I, I want to bring out how important it is 
to be able to, to check your emotions and to check the headlines. And, you know, so what I'm speaking specifically about is, is several quarters ago, uh, there was a rampant just discussion of, of high tech, large tech, large cap. Uh, and, and there was so much emotion and, and, and um, feelings into them. The price got away. We were talking about the price to sales in those companies as even though they're great growth companies, they may not great, great investments here. Now this rotation into oil, I want to share, you know, go back to our discussion earlier we were having today where some of the oil prices have started to move. The oil stocks seemingly have moved, but, but perhaps the whole rotation hasn't happened yet. Right. For some reason, um, the, the oil industry stocks are underperforming the movements in crude. And traditionally, historically, they, they sort of move together. Uh, now there's still a correlation, but, but the energy stocks are not moving with the strength that crude oil has been moving. And maybe that's because investors don't believe the movements in crude, um, or maybe it's because energy stocks did so poorly for so long that people are reticent to get into them. Um, right. And so same with the airlines where, you know, we're known at one point to be terrible investments. People are afraid of them. I guess the point I'm making is that what you're looking at, uh, we talked about a lot of sectors are kind of in the middle, but the real value comes in finding the most undervalued and the most overvalued and, and really making sure you're not, following a crowd into the deepest part of the water at the wrong time. Exactly. And that, that's why you have to keep uh, not getting too excited and, and, and look at the numbers and understand what they mean. And, you know, one example is uh, tech does not do well in inflation. And you could go back and check that, um, looking at the inflationary periods and how tech did. Um, and as we're now entering an inflationary period, regardless of how long it lasts, tech is going to be under, under pressure. And it's not going to perform the way it did from 2018 to 2020. Right. Well, it let's talk about you know, all of our discussions, Ed, are all about risk management. We know the processes we're using for stock selection is strong. The, the issue is what you just hit it right on the head, that it really matters what you pay and, and also the, the length of kind of rotation, maybe people say, you know, one month, two months, that's enough. Um, I think research says that um, there's more of rotation coming. And, and I think that there's some people in tech land that haven't really adjusted to some maybe risks in their portfolio and you know, we know tech will infiltrate every sector. It, we're not anti-tech, we're anti-risk. Right, exactly. I mean, sure, tech is, is increasing, its, increasing its penetration. I mean, now it's going into the automobile industry, which is the biggest industry in the world. Uh, and so there's going to be a massive demand for semiconductors and, and various microprocessors and everything else. Um, but um, the, the semi-industry will expand to meet that with CapEx. Um, but and that tends to be a very cyclical industry from a stock price point of view. And um, right now it's actually sort of starting to recover from the hit it took in the last couple of months. Right. Um, so, so Ed, let me tease something up, which is I think on everyone's subject, including Mike and Dom, who I want to ask Andrew, our Cracker Jack engineer to bring on because the subject is right now about inflation and, and our costs too high. And, 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 you know, we're used to this kind of zero interest rate and, and zero inflation. I don't think that's history. And I think this is the, the thing, not the short term, but the long term that, that worries everybody. So let, let me let Dom and Mike come on and, and, and kind of couch it their own way, but take it sure. on. Hey, hey uh, this is Michael. Thanks for joining us again this evening. Thank you. Good to see you. You're, you're welcome. Yes. Good to see you. So, Ed, every now and again, I'll go to a conference or he, I'll jump on a Zoom call now. 
And we'll, I'll hear economists or portfolio managers say that the cycles we go through are more violent now, that what used to take two or three years to manifest itself in the market now it takes a couple of months or a couple of weeks. Um, do you buy into that? Or, or when you and Jordan were talking about sector rotation and, and inflation, do you still think it takes a, a longer period of time to work their way through? Or do you think these periods that we are experiencing now is the new normal? Well, I, there's a little of both. I think the, the shorter term things are work, where it involves information are working their way through faster because people have better access to information on what's going on in the world. So uh, when, when OPEC makes a decision like they did today to not expand their production, the whole world knows it in 30 seconds. So futures respond to that. And, for, and, and managers you know, move stocks because of that. But in something like inflation, like the debate now, uh, the answer is, is, is somewhat unclear and some of the causal impacts of inflation um, can last for a long time. And so it's hard to, to see, the short ter that, see it in the short term. And, and an example is the following. Obviously inflation has increased right now because everybody's raising prices from recovery, gasoline going up and, and uh, driving is increasing and uh, restaurants as what I just said, are, there's less of them. And so there's less pressure um, on competitive pricing. And you're gonna have that kind of inflation for the next couple of years, whether it's 3% or 3.5%, uh, you know, I, I don't know, and uh, nobody does. but. The other aspect of inflation is that we're building up massive debt. And there's a huge historical negative correlation between debt and economic growth. And so in the long run, large debt hurts, infl you know, <clears throat> hurts inflation. And so it is true that the inflation that we're uh, experiencing now will not last but we want to hope that it doesn't not last because debt gets so big that it destroys economic growth. And that you don't see from looking at it because it takes a couple of years. It's usually two to three years after the debt peaks that inflation bottoms. And so, I, I literally remember it was the year 2000 and I went to a seminar is value investing Debt, value investing dead. That was the title of the of the seminar. And we had gone through a decade where growth outperformed only to be followed by about a decade of value outperforming only to be followed by a decade of growth outperforming. Are we getting ready for another decade of value outperforming? Yes, I think that um, I don't know if it'll outperform the way it has in the past six months, but we definitely getting into a, a, a regime where value is going to do much better. And, and won't that tie into your discussion, your argument <clears throat> about inflation? Wouldn't that, isn't that kind of uh, the kryptonite for growth investors? Yes, exactly. Inflation is going to hurt the growth stocks. And okay, you're seeing but, but it already. Let, let me jump in here, Ed, because this is really- Now, important. the growth stocks with, with good valuation will do better than the growth stocks right. with, so with prices we're, we're, of 20. So the, the whole point, and we've had, Ed, you, you know, we've talked about uh, Professor Siegel coming on the show, that even though the growth stocks may get hurt, the best inflation hedge is actually ownership of companies with growing dividends. And, and, and when you talk about a regime change, uh, this has been our whole tilt to more safe uh, and conservative portfolios. Yes, absolutely. You, you especially want dividends because you need income and you can't get it from the bank or you know CDs or anything like that. Um, so you need solid stocks with good dividends, absolutely. And those have lower volatility now than um, <laughs> the other ones. Right, I, I guess what I'm bringing up, Ed, is, is the discussion you know, on the tip of people's tongue is that inflation is bad for the stock market, but that's not actually the case. 
Not, not absolutely, absolutely, that's not true, right. There are plenty of stocks that do well during inflationary periods, as we saw, you know, but, but it was, is also true that the market um, really began to take off after uh, Volcker started to get inflation under control. And it really never got out of control again uh, the way it was for the next, until now. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to see counterexamples. But yeah, the market will still do all right um, if inflation um, stays two to 4%, I would say. And you, said, and you said inflation got out of control. You don't see inflation out of control now, do you? I, it's not out of control yet. I think there's a potential for it to get out of control if the Fed, uh, it, actually it's more the, the government um, was spending a lot of money and uh, without raising taxes to compensate, um, you're putting um, positive fiscal policy and positive monetary policy together at the same time that you have strong growth to begin with. That, that causes inflation. And someone's gonna to have to do something to stop it um, or to mitigate it before it gets out of hand. And um, it's unlikely to be the Fed, I think. And it's not clear that the Fed can do it alone anyway. So, you know, we're gonna to have to have some kind of uh, fiscal restraint, either spread spending out over longer period of time or um, have more tax increases than are being discussed right now. So, so Ed, just, just kind of adding on that note, and we only have a minute left here. So, you know, kind of wrapping this up is that what you're describing is, is again, Jimmy Rogers was on the show, a major bear, and people are worried about the end of the end of the end. Our job is to just keep ratcheting down the risk and making sure that we're not in the riskiest parts of the market because there is a lot of danger you know we, we continue to think in the riskiest part of the market uh, with risk control diversification the emphasis on the quality factors that we go over every week with the portfolio uh, that's i think the biggest value we could add and there'll be cycles we, we know in the end the market will be higher in years from now, the key is not to lose the money when the market's the richest, right? Right, exactly. You just don't make too many mistakes. And if the market doesn't give you anything for a certain period of time, then that you can't get it. But, you know, you just have to do risk mitigation to make sure you keep what you have so that when new opportunities arise, you take advantage. Well, that's the mantra here, you know, frankly, at Labenthal, and we try to generate a lot of income and, and bring growth with it, but risk is everything, and, and uh, thanks for your time. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to be back with more Labenthal Report following the quick break. Financial planning and security can sometimes be seen as a moving target. The rules change constantly, and you need guidance to stay ahead of the market moves. This is the Labenthal Report with Michael Hartzman and Dominic Tavella. We'll break down the news, trends, and overall direction of the markets. Now, back to the Labenthal Report. All right, I'm Michael Hartzman, back with Dominic Tavella for a quick wrap-up of our two guests and in Dom, I guess the theme between Mary and Ed is nothing lasts forever. So, you know, uh, both you and I uh, came into industry 30 some odd years ago, right? And it was buy and hold. Do you remember that, Mike? Yeah. Buy and hold. Buy some company, some good quality company and hold it forever. Um, and how would that strategy have worked out with some, even some very well-known names um, over the last 30 years? That, um, you have to rotate the portfolio. You have to rebalance. You have to be active. Um, you have to pay attention. I mean, it sounds kind of obvious, but uh, you and I, every day, right, we see uh, new clients that are onboarding with us and we're reviewing uh, portfolios that they've had. Um, and they have positions that they've held 5, 10, 20, 30 years in some cases, right? Um, and the buy and hold strategy didn't work out too well. 
you know, every time I hear that expression, you know, by, um, I'm sorry, uh, rotating the portfolio, I always think of landscaping. I always think of being out there with your rake and, and turning over that dirt and getting that, that, that rich soil underneath um, back on top. And, and really that's what you have to do with your investments, right? You have to, you have to trim them back. You have to clean them up and you have to rotate into, into new things as they, um, as they present themselves. Uh, listen, it's not a, an accident that our company logo is of a plow horse and somebody planting seeds in the ground. And the idea of a garden where it gets tended and maintained and cleaned up and weeded and uh, fruit is harvested on a regular basis. Uh, you know, there, there, there is a reason for all that, right? Yes, yes, there is. And, um, and, and frequently, you know, people listen to this show and, and it really, it's sometimes, even to me, sounds like we're speaking another language. Um, but at the end of the day, what this really all about, is all about is just staying on top of what you own and making sure that what you own is still timely and being aware of what's happening next. And every week, like a broken record, inflation and taxes, inflation and taxes, inflation and taxes. So we just have to continue to be mindful of that and make sure our portfolios are set up as these things continue to manifest themselves. And, and they will, both those uh, items are going to have a dramatic effects on what these markets and our portfolios do the balance of the year. And we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about it. We'll probably do it the next show, but the Biden administration has put forth a really aggressive tax uh, plan, and that could have really, really large implications for uh, both taxpayers, uh, the economy, corporate individuals. This could be a major player in what happens to the balance of this year. Down to this year, but I also think, Dominic, it's going to be a major factor, but I really think this year, the Biden administration is going to focus on the reopening of the economy, getting the economy back to normal, and maybe towards the end of this year, and certainly for sure in 2022, everyone's going to be talking about income taxes. So I honestly don't think he's going to be able to get much done or even try to get much done for the remainder of this year. Inflation, yes. Income taxes, I'm not so sure about. Uh, so for the record, he did propose that the, the capital gains tax would be retroactive to the end of April of this year. Now, that might be a negotiating stance, right? You throw out uh, your, your most aggressive stance and then you negotiate back from that. And, and then I guess the other side relieved that you didn't go that quite that far. Right. They certainly are and put on the table that they would look retroactively to the end of April of this year. Uh, and that, again, a capital gains rate that would be in excess of 40% uh, for, on top of whatever your local state is going to tax you. That, that could be very dramatic and very, and very much hurt the average be, uh, taxpayer out there. Oh my there, God, right? it, it would be a disaster. But like, like I said, I'm just, I'm hopeful and, and that, that he does not get that accomplished this year. Well, Mike, you usually are pretty spot on. So here's to you being 100% spot on on this one. I, I look forward to you being correct. I think it would <laughs> gratefully, I would be glad to go with that one you nailed, Mike. Hopefully you're 100% spot on on that one. Well, thank you. Well, to be continued. And Dominic, you stay safe and well. You as and well. We'll Mike. see you right back here next week, everybody. Good evening, all. Thanks for tuning in to the Labenthal Report. Dominic, Michael, and Jordan will be back for our next program, airing next Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Time and 5 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Business Channel. Until then, have a great week.